So our topic now is going to be climate smart food security. And as we all understand, and as we've heard this morning, um, climate change and resource scarcity is and is going to increasingly place stresses across the global food system. And many of these challenges will negatively influence food security and, and food safety and uh, nutritional quality for people across the globe. Our panel will highlight climate smart and sustainable approaches to food security and determine how the private sector is increasing value chains resilience in the face of these changing uh, climates and also in, in the face of variable weather uh, indeed. And so the question is how can we respond to these challenges? What are some practical on the ground strategies? Um, our panelists are um, Howard Buffett um, who is president of Buffett Farms in Nebraska um, and he's also a lecturer at Columbia University where he works on um, global uh, responses. Jason Clay, Senior Vice President, Markets and Food, World Wildlife Fund. Uh, he's been uh, at, on, at the USDA and he also is, uh, has worked on a family farm. Uh, Strive Masiwa is Chairman and Founder of Econet Wireless. It's a telecommunications firm, particularly looking at Africa and development in Africa. Gerald Nelson is Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he's the principal author of the Chicago Council Report, Advancing Food Security in the Face of a Changing Climate. Danielle Nirenberg is president of Food Tank, of the Food Think Tank, and she's an expert on sustainable agriculture. And Judith Schwartz, who's an author um, from Chelsea Green Publishing, and her emphasis is um, on soil issues as a center, as a hub for agriculture and food security, and very often under uh, studied area. So with that, we're going to begin. And uh, the first question will go to Strive Amasiwa. Strive, what do you see as a major as major impacts of climate change for African agriculture, and what should the U.S. do in this area? Uh, thank you very much, and good morning. You know, I'm on the board of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which looks at the interests of smallholder farmers. And a couple of years ago, Kofi Annan, my predecessor in the chair, and I went to Mali. And, uh, you know, he's a bit of a rock star there. <laughs> and we had thousands of smallholder farmers as we traveled through northern Mali with uh, Sylvia Matthews Burwell, as well as a member of the board. And, you know, we had briefed Kofi about all the issues we thought the smallholder farmers were going to ask him about. You know, we thought they were going to talk about their problems with access to land and uh, access to uh, finance and so forth. And most of the farmers that we met were women. And to our great surprise, these uneducated farmers in northern Mali, the moment we opened it up for discussion, they started to talk about climate change. They started to tell us that the rains are not coming as regularly as they used to. They started to tell us that the yields are falling. They started to tell us that they need a different kind of seed. Is there a way we could help them? You know, and we thought, oh, you know, maybe this is a one-off. But, you know, as we went through that area, farmer after farmer, that, and that for me, basically laid it out. This is what climate change is about. It's not a, we can have debates about what causes it, but these are the people on the ground, and that's what they were talking about. So, just to close in respect to the latter part of your question, what can we do about it? Certainly, what can the United States do about it? For a start, you're alive, your government is very much alive to this issue. They're alive to the fact that uh, we need, with pro through programs like Feed the Future, we need to do more to help develop resilience amongst smallholder farmers, because that is the key, their resilience. Their way of life is being affected. All the progress that we have made 
uh, with respect to improving yields is now is in danger of falling back. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Um, Jerry, what do you see as the top research priorities to deal with the challenge of feeding a growing population in the face of climate change? Well, I'd like to, to first take this opportunity to thank the Chicago Council for inviting me to prepare this report, but especially to thank the advisory committee. In, in activities like this that I've done in the past, the advisory committees play an honorary role. This was an extremely active advisory committee, which how, well was a, an important part of. And the report is much better as a result of the interventions of the advisory committee and the co-chairs and the staff at the Chicago Council. So thanks to all of them. Let me, let me give three related responses to this. But first of all, let me say that I'm an economist and, and a former US president once said, yeah, please send me a one-handed economist because they're always saying on the one hand and on the other hand. <laughs> I will attempt to be a one-handed economist for the most part uh, in this presentation. Um, so the first thing I would say is that the challenges that we face are not exclusive to the climate change arena. This is a food security and, and climate change threat. And we need to understand that those are not individual separable items. I've been uh, on occasion given advice to, to government policymakers that they should actually ignore the coming effects of climate change and focus on getting the food, uh, food security challenges addressed today. Um, and there are things that you can do today to address food security challenges that also contribute to a dealing with climate change adaptation and mitigation. So uh, as an economist, I would say that getting prices right is a really important part of that story. Sending market signals to farmers who can then respond and to uh, business people in the uh, marketing chain from the, from the farm to the uh, uh, consumer means that people understand the real scarcity of the resources that they're using and then make better decisions about how to do that. So whether it's getting fertilizer prices right. Fertilizer prices are too high in Africa, resulting in too low use. Fertilizer prices are too low in Asia, resulting too high use. Um, so getting prices right for fertilizer. Understanding how water itself is a scarce resource and we need to figure out ways to uh, more properly value it and get the users of water to understand that scarcity. Soil, a scarce resources, and even ecosystem services are important. And we need to understand and provide incentives to use those resources based on their scarcity. Prices are one obvious mechanism that make that happen. Let me turn now to the research, the biological research questions that I think are really important that, that came out of research that was done as part of the inputs into this report that we've done. And I would say, there are two or three big research questions, and they involve really hardcore basic science. The applied research that is done in the CGIR system, that is done by the private sector around the world and public sector will continue, and indeed must continue. Uh, the 2% decline that's often quoted from the IPCC report is on top of a yield trend that has been generally upwards but slowing over the last few years. And so it pushes down the efforts that are undertaken by the biotech companies and by the University of Illinois researchers and the, and the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science researchers to improve productivity. Climate change reduces those. It's a drag on yield. But it's going to become an increasingly big drag. So we need basic research uh, in two or three areas. The first one is that we know higher temperatures are coming and plants in particular, I'll focus on them, are susceptible to higher temperatures. They have an optimum. We need to increase that optimum. Basic research is needed. We don't know how to do that yet. The second thing is to remove the constraints in particular parts of the plant's life. So drought tolerance was mentioned earlier, and the way you can deal with drought tolerance is to make it so that the corn plant, for example, is less susceptible, particularly to that period in its productive life when it pollinates. If you get a really hot, dry period and peak of pollination, your yields go down dramatically. Those are two areas that I think we need to have substantial breakthroughs in, in scientific research, and that's going to require some substantial increases in funding to those researchers who are capable to do that both in the public and the private sector. And third, I think um, sometimes I call this the boring but critical part of what we need to be undertaking. Um, to understand the future, you need to think about ways to model the future. You know, how are we going to get from here to tomorrow? 
And there are a variety of potential paths we can take, but if we don't understand what those potential paths are and what the outcomes are of going along those paths, then we can misuse the resources that we have to invest today. So improved modeling of uh, economic pathways, of biological pathways, of hydrological pathways are really critical. The results in the IPCC report depend upon the models that we have today, the quantitative results. The models that we have today don't include key, key elements of threats from climate change. And so until they're incorporated, the results that you see from the IPCC are necessarily optimistic. Um, but modeling in the absence of understanding is also a mistake. If you don't have data on what's going on, you really need to collect better data that's appropriate to the challenges that we have. We've really reduced our investments in data, and that needs to change. Let me close with just one uh, final point. Um, there's a technical appendix to this document, which is in the back, and, and the report was completed. The technical appendix gave <coughs> the opportunity to add a few, and I must say, really depressing results. Um, and it's in the last paragraph of that te technical appendix. You've all seen the news about how the uh, Ar Antarctic ice cap is thinning and the ice, uh, part of the chunk of, the, uh, of that is moving into the ocean. It's increasingly, that has increased greatly the potential for as much as a three meter increase in sea level between in the next hundred years or so. Ignoring the effects on Washington DC and New York, which will not be small, Think just about agriculture. Roughly half of the country of Bangladesh would be covered in water if that takes place. All of Vietnamese rice production is likely to be wiped out. Something like 20% of Egyptian high productivity agriculture will go. Other countries around the world in terms of percentages will see big change. In China, it could be as much as 3 million hectares. Small share of China's uh, agricultural lands, but a huge part of their productive rice systems. These are things that really make me not sleep well at night. Thank you. Um, next, Jason, um, what are the most promising approaches to agriculture that advance food security while reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So I want to talk a little bit about how to think about this issue and, and put a few issues on the table without, without going into a great deal of detail about them. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about climate smart agriculture, and I think uh, most people would agree that climate smart ag is probably being more efficient and more productive, uh, and that gets us five or ten years into this issue. But I think climate smart agriculture in the longer term has got to be about switching crops and switching geographies because we're not going to be able to grow things where we grow them today. And the farmers that make that transition quicker, are the early adopters are going to be ahead quicker. Here's the problem. A lot of the wealthier farmers are going to be able to make these, these transitions. They're going to be able to hire the experts. They're going to be able to get the training, buy different farms, etc. cetera. Uh, smaller farmers are not. Smaller farmers are also farmers that are often farming more marginal land. They're more precarious already. Uh, and they are going to be faced with declining productivity in crops that they don't produce terribly well already in many cases from an efficiency point of view. What are they going to do when they're faced with planting a new crop that they know nothing about, that they've never produced before? That's going to be a big environmental issue that has greenhouse gas kind of implications as well. In general, I think that we need to focus on productivity, efficiency, waste, and consumption if we're going to have a climate smart food system. We can't afford to maximize just one of those things. We've got to optimize all of them. And so that's how we need to begin to think about it. Let me just give a few examples of what I mean. On the production, productivity, and efficiency side, uh, we need to have more sustainable intensification. Does that mean that the most intensive farmers today need to get more intensive? Probably not. In fact, we may need to back off of some of those areas like dairy production in the Netherlands or, or whatever. But what it means is that the bottom 25% of producers globally today, by performance, produce probably 50% of the impacts that we care about, including habitat loss, deforestation, uh, repairing an area loss, soil erosion, etc. But they only produce 10% of the food. So if we want to increase food security, where do we focus? On the better producers or on the worst? 
we get more gains by focusing on the worst. We could actually double global food production without putting any more land in production at all by working with the bottom 25% of producers and reduce those key environmental impacts as well. One thing that we know from a lot of studies is that how food is produced is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the food industry rather than where it's produced and where it's shipped to. So getting production better on the farm is a great greenhouse gas reduction strategy. We need to grow the right crops in the right places. We, we can anticipate where population is going to increase, where income is going to increase, and where consumption is going to increase. That's where we need to be focusing our efforts. But we need to take into account what are the nutrients and calories that are the most efficiently produced in those areas. And it may not be corn and soybeans and wheat and rice. Uh, bananas in Costa Rica produce 20 times more calories than corn in Iowa. Sugar in Brazil produces 60 times more calories than corn in Iowa. Why don't we focus on putting more nutrients in sugar and bananas, because they've already got the productivity thing going for them. Uh, we need to change the way we think about how we solve these problems. There was a mention in the earlier panel that waste is a big issue. Uh, it's about one in three calories are wasted. Well, if you look at that another way, waste is 50% of the new food we need to produce by 2050. Without producing any more, just eliminating waste, that's half of the new food we need. If you look at it another way, if agriculture, as the US and Norwegian governments have said, all in, including habitat loss and, and land use change, is about 30 to 35 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, the latest data shows it a little bit below 30. If one in three calories is wasted, that means 10 percent of greenhouse gas emissions are just from food waste, food that's not eaten by us, by a cow, or by a car. So we've got to, got to really crank down on that kind of thing as well. There's big gains to be made from, from food waste. I think the final issue, and this will be my, my last point, is comparative advantage is real. Some places produce food more efficiently than others. Trade has got to be part of any kind of system that is going to efficiently produce and move food around the planet. And we're already seeing responses to that. Since 2000, the percentage of food that's traded globally has gone from about 6% to 12 to 15%. Now, that's all in. So that, that number is lower than most people think. But 12 to 15% of food being traded is a huge amount. And, and there's real, uh, I think, opportunities to increase the efficiency of how food is produced using trade as, as part of that. But it raises basic questions like, could we begin to convince a country like China, as it consumes more animal protein, to start importing animal protein rather than grains? Because when it imports grains, it produces more pollution locally. It produces animal protein less efficiently than if it bought it on global markets. And we know that the impact of food production from a greenhouse gas point of view is how you produce it. So we could, have a bit, we could start thinking about the most efficient places to produce food and which types of food in which places as a, as a way to address greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to Danielle, um, what practices can smallholders carry out that both mitigate climate change and increase yields? Thanks, Barbara. I also want to say good morning to you all and thank the Chicago Council for putting on this important forum for discussing food security and climate change. It's a huge honor for me to be here, and I also want to thank our other panelists for sharing their expertise. Uh, first, I, I don't think we can talk about fighting climate change without talking about family farmers. Uh, there are at least 500 million family farmers around the world, both big and small, who are producing at least 57% uh, of the world's food. And uh, to successfully reduce carbon emissions and improve food security, they, these family farmers must be on the front lines of climate change. And, and the good news is that they're already fighting that fight. Um, I've had the opportunity uh, from doing on the ground research to visit hundreds of farmers and farmers groups around the world. Uh, and the most exciting innovations that are happening on the ground to help mitigate climate uh, change and increase yields are those that come from the ground up and that really rely on the knowledge and expertise of farmers themselves. 
The United Nations has designated this year, 2014, as the International Year of Family Farmers, um, of Family Farming. And it, it's a great uh, and exciting opportunity to really uh, celebrate the expertise of these farmers. Again, both large, medium, and small farmers uh, around the world. Um, Food Tank, which is my organization, has uh, had the opportunity also to collaborate with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization around highlighting stories of hope and success in family farming. And really driving home the idea that farmers are more than food producers. They're uh, teachers in their communities that share their, their knowledge and their expertise. They're innovators and inventors who are, are, are spreading their practices. And they're stewards of the land who are rarely recognized for the ecosystem services they provide that benefit us all, including sequestering carbon in soils and, and mitigating climate change in other ways. And, and I think that there's a tendency to really blame farmers and to blame agriculture for a lot of these problems. And I, I want to challenge you all to really think about agriculture as the solution, not only as the solution to climate change, but some of our other most pressing environmental and social problems, whether it's unemployment or conflict or uh, migration and, and, and other things. So uh, there are a couple of things that I just want to talk about this morning um, that I, you know, I'm seeing on the ground that really support this idea that agriculture can be the solution. Um, first, we're seeing a lot more sort of investment and, and interest in agroforestry methods and the reintroduction of indigenous crops uh, that are really being uh, uh, seen as a, as a solution to, to both climate change and uh, the, the epidemic of hunger and, and obesity around the world. Um, for example, trees provide not only shade and stability to soils, but they can also help increase water availability uh, to crops. And leguminous trees, or fertilizer trees, as they're often referred to, can provide a natural source of fertilizer to crops, eliminating the need for small-scale farmers to buy expensive artificial fertilizer that comes out of a bag. Uh, indigenous crops are often referred to as weeds or poor people's foods, but uh, and, and today we should remember is the International Day of, of Biological Diversity, so it's important to remember that some of these indigenous crops are resilient to pests and disease, they're uh, able to withstand, withstand droughts and flooding, they're often very nutrient dense, and so they can be part of the solution in, in addressing a, a lot of different problems. Um, and, and indigenous crops do something else. When they're part of diverse cropping systems where farmers aren't relying on just one or two crops, they provide a source of insurance in case pests or disease or drought again uh, affect one of those crops. They, they make farmers more resilient to the impacts of climate change. The, the second thing I want to talk about is that farmers are really going beyond seeds and other inputs, and they're focusing on building soils. And this is something Howard's dad has talked about quite a bit, the need for a brown revolution and a focus on, on building soils, uh, things like cover cropping, uh, green manures, no-till agriculture, other aspects of conservation agriculture can be a really important way to build soils, which are you know, the, really the main ingredient uh, of farming. And then the third uh, solution I want to talk about is something we've heard a lot about today and really uh, is an exciting uh, aspect of, of this discussion and, and something that's long been ignored, and that's the issue of, of food loss and waste. Uh, we're, as Jason said, we're wasting about one-third uh, of the food that we produce, and, and farmers are, and eaters alike are, are making a lot of changes to make better use of the food that we already produce uh, and, and focusing on things like better roads and transportation for farmers so that they can get their crops to market before they go bad, uh, better storage facilities, better drying mats and racks. Uh, uh, things like cooling centers that are being used in Rwanda through Heifer International and the Gates Foundation, or the, the innovation in India where farmers at markets are using uh, low-cost uh, coolers to keep their, their produce from rotting so that they can make uh, more income out of it. And I think one thing that we haven't talked about with, with food waste and food loss is that we're not only losing the food and nutrition 
itself, we're also losing the labor and the resources and the income that, that those farmers put into those things and that they expect to get. And so we can do a lot to really raise uh, efficiency and, and raise productivity and, and also increase farmers' incomes if we're, if we're preventing food loss and waste. Um, I, I, I want to conclude by saying that I'm not suggesting that we return uh, to unproductive agriculture methods or, or trying to romanticize subsistence agriculture. I, I think there's a real opportunity to combine high and low technologies uh, in agriculture to make sure that farmers can do their jobs better. Uh, the most obvious and, and sort of uh, the most impactful one that we've seen over the last few years is the use of cell phone technology and the internet. Um, farmers are, are using their cell phones to get better inf information about weather and markets and even using them to spot different livestock and crop diseases. And, and farmers are also embracing things like solar drip irrigation uh, to more efficiently get water to their crops and, uh, you know, without the use of, of fossil fuel resources. And, and then finally, I think one of the most important things to remember about some of the things that farmers are doing to mitigate or adapt to climate change is that they also have a range of side benefits. They're not just impacting climate change. They're improving dietary diversity, they're protecting natural resources and biodiversity, uh, and doing a whole range of other things. And, and these are things that go well beyond productivity and benefit agricultural landscapes, farmers, and eaters alike. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Judith? Livestock are known for their contribution to climate change. Can you talk to us about the role they can play in climate change mitigation? Sure. Thank you, Barbara, and thanks to the Chicago Council for the opportunity. The impact of livestock, particularly cattle, on climate is something that many people feel strongly about. I've heard it argued that the best way to stop climate change is to get rid of cattle altogether. This approach, to put it mildly, is missing some nuance. <laughs> <laughs> to understand how livestock and climate intersect, it's useful to look at it from two standpoints. First is the direct impact on greenhouse gas emissions, and two, in terms of land climate dynamics. On the greenhouse gas side, the discussion often gets muddied because people confuse management with the animals themselves. Clear-cutting forests to create cattle pasture is not climate-smart management. Ditto for putting cattle or pigs into feedlot operations where their manure goes into lagoons, which creates the ideal circumstances for the production of methane. As for the methane that cattle produce as a result of their digestive process, the situation is more complex than as often presented. If cattle are run, on healthy land, there will be methane-consuming bacteria in the soil, and the methane cycle will be in balance. In the case of restorative grazing, which I'll get to in a second, the presence of animals will be carbon negative due to the building of soil carbon. Again, it's a matter of management. Which brings us to the impact of livestock on the land. We tend to think of climate as a sky phenomenon, but it's also about what happens to land, whether soil is storing carbon or releasing it, whether the land is bare, which creates sensible heat, or covered with plants, which disperses heat, whether water is evaporating or held in the soil and cycling through plants, which is a cooling mechanism. The mismanagement of livestock brings us to the wrong side of each of those scenarios and has had hugely detrimental consequences to the environment. On the other hand, properly managed livestock can help restore the water, solar, and nutrient cycles and facilitate the growth of deep-rooted perennial grasses that sequester carbon. So when I talk about restorative grazing, the model that I know most about is, is called Holistic Planned Grazing, which was developed by Alan Savory. Basically, this is a decision-making process that's based on two core insights. One is that ruminants and grasslands evolve together so that land needs the animals in the same way that animals need the land. And secondly, that while land can certainly be overgrazed, 
it can also be undergrazed. So essentially, when it's all working, and this is a matter of management, the animals w function as a kind of biological accelerator. Their nibbling stimulates the growth of grasses. Notice I say nibbling and not, you know, they're, 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 they're moved before they can eat the grasses down to the roots, so, the, so this kind of keeps the grasses growing. <coughs> um, their trampling aerates the soil and presses in seeds so that a, a, bi a diversity of grasses get a chance to germinate, and their waste fertilizes the soil. And also, this sounds kind of technical, but their, their hooves press in grasses so that they, are, they get in contact with the microorganisms that would break them down, because what happens without the animal impact is that dead grass accumulates, um, interferes with the sun, you know, the solar energy, um, reaching the plants, and anyway, that's, that's a side thing. But the effects of animal impact on this way, the effects on land function and productivity can be tremendous. We're talking about landscapes transformed. Given the large percentage of our planet's surface that's native grassland and rageland, and the large percentage of that that is desertifying and leaking carbon, this kind of restorative grazing practices is some, there's something that we might consider looking into further and scaling up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Howard, what role do conservation-based production practices play in preserving natural resources while producing high yields? Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> they play an absolutely critical role. Conservation-based farming uh, is, is mandatory for preserving resources and also maintaining or increasing your yield over time. Uh, but I'll, I'll first say I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I want to thank the council. It's always an honor to be the least distinguished member of a panel, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll stay that way for a while. And um, you know, I want to thank everyone that's participated in this, from from Lisa to Megan to Tria to everybody on the team, but particularly Dan Glickman. Uh, Dan has served as a mentor of mine for a few years, and uh, when I lived in D.C. about four years ago, he really helped me transition from looking at agriculture policy. Uh, to looking at, at real life agriculture and in field agriculture and making that transition. And so I started uh, taking over our farm back home in Nebraska and I've been farming that for about three or four years now. And so I'm going to give you a, just a very small personal anecdote uh, that will help illustrate my broader point. About three to four years ago, you might remember we had a very large drought uh, that hit the Midwest, Mississippi River and also the Missouri River. Uh, and that drought uh, flooded, I'm sorry, we had a huge flood, excuse me. Uh, I'll get to the drought in a second. We had a huge flood that hit uh, the Mississippi River and, uh, and the Missouri. Uh, and th that flood reached to a, about a mile from where my farmland was. And that was really my first year farming. So I thought, okay, good. That, I've experienced this. I survived this. We're fine. And then the second year came. And as you just heard me mention, we had uh, a historic drought, uh, one of the worst that we've ever had. And, uh, and again, survived that. Uh, th things turned out well on the farm. I thought, good. All right. Now I've kind of cleared each extreme in the weather here in terms of volatility. Uh, and uh, so then we hit this year, and uh, I'm at my farm about five days ago, and it turns out that four nights in a row of, of frost and near-freezing weather had pretty much taken out my entire cornfield. So I was standing there looking out over about five and a half million corn plants on 160 acres, and they were all just brown and withered and laying on the ground, and I just, my heart sank. I mean, this is just a, a horrible scene to see. I mean, it, 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 it's something I'd never experienced, obviously. I've only been farming for three years. But then fast forward about 48 hours, we, we ordered up some good sun and, and strong winds and high temperatures, uh, and the entire field rebounded. I mean, in 48 hours, the corn was completely green again. It was standing up. It was already growing new leaves. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is really remarkable. And to me, that illustrated two things. It illustrated both the fragility of what we're doing in agriculture and the lack of control that we have over things, including the weather. Uh, but it also illustrated the resiliency that we have as well, especially in our production systems here in the United States. Now, I think one challenge is, is that resilience doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate to our, our global environment. And so part of what we've been doing is we've been looking at exactly how a lot of different conservation-based practices, and I'll get to those in a second, can translate to increasing the resilience of our global environment through our production practices, especially our large-scale production. Uh, and so as uh, Clay mentioned earlier, He's focusing mostly on the bottom 25%. Uh, I'm sorry, Jason, excuse me. As Jason uh, mentioned earlier, he's focusing primarily on the bottom 25% of uh, farmers. And a lot of what we've been doing 
through our family foundation and our research has been on the top 25% of farmers as well. It's been, all right, how do we start really improving the practices of the larger scale uh, production farmers here, especially in the US? So part of what we've looked at is uh, what we kind of call our, our arc of conservation. Uh, first is what I like to call anti-tillage. So that's a little bit different than what you hear when you hear no-till. And in part because I think no-till can, can drive away a lot of farmers and a lot of producers who say, well, you know, sometimes I'll need to till for this reason or for that reason, or maybe I live in northern Minnesota and it's required for what we're doing. Whatever that might be, that's, that's fine. I don't want to exclude anyone from this. So we call this anti-tillage. And if you're not familiar with tillage, it's just breaking up the soil uh, to plant your field. And, and nowadays we've got uh, wonderful equipment that allows us uh, to plant no-till without any challenges at all. Uh, the second area we look at is really just broad resource management. We talk about water management primarily through um, high efficiency water application. We use center pivots on our farm in Nebraska, uh, and that tends to be extremely more efficient than flood irrigation and other forms. Uh, we look at how do we apply nitrogen in a way that's uh, healthier for the plants and healthier for the field that also reduces the amount uh, of leaching and runoff. Uh, and then uh, we also look at residue as also one of our nutrient management techniques, leaving crop residue on the farm uh, and not taking it off for biofuel production. Uh, a lot of farmers have grown to call uh, residue trash uh, which we think is, is too bad because the crop residue actually breaks down and releases a lot of nutrients back into the soil. So it's a critical part of the system from our perspective. And then the third piece is around uh, crop rotations. Uh, and it's become a habit for a lot of farmers to grow corn after corn after corn year after year and really put a lot of demands on the soil. Uh, and uh, it's been shown that the best crop rotation would be corn, soybeans, and wheat, depending on where you are in the United States, and then repeating that process again. Uh, but another key element to crop rotations uh, is cover crops. And so we've spent a lot of time looking at the effect of cover crops um, on farmland across the U.S. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that the use of cover crops has grown quite significantly. Uh, I grow radishes as a cover crop on my farm. So you'll see radishes out in the field growing uh, when there's not corn or soybeans uh, in the field. Uh, but we've seen actually dramatic increase in the use of cover crops uh, over the past few years. We've gone from about 2 million acres in the U.S. to roughly 10 million acres uh, and we hosted a, uh, a conference with USDA in February in Omaha where we set out a goal of 20 million acres by the year of 2020. So we're really looking at cover crops and all of the good that they do uh, to help build the organic matter in the soil, to prevent runoff, uh, and to do all the good things that they do. Uh, on, uh, on a closing point here, um, I just wanted to say that tying this back together, despite the extreme weather volatility that we've had, uh, especially as I said in my kind of personal experience in Nebraska, both uh, with the flood, the drought, and then now more recently the frost and the freezing, uh, that we've experienced, we've still had a 20% increase uh, in yields over the last three years. And I attribute almost all of that to the conservation methods that we've put in. Uh, the better use of water application through our pivots, the use of cover crops, going to an all-no-till system, uh, and, a, and a whole host of other practices that we've done. And so despite that, we've seen the resilience on our farm, uh, despite the weather challenges, but you know, that's not going to be the case for farmers everywhere, and it's certainly not going to be the case for farmers outside the United States. Thank you. Um, at this point, I, I think we have about 30 minutes left, and I think it might be interesting to just maybe have the panel um, follow up on some of these issues. So I wanted to start, Howard, just asking, um, how are the conservation practices that you use on your farm, how could they be applicable, for example, to smallholder farmers in Africa? Th that's a great question. And uh, the, the answer is very applicable, but only in, in an appropriate way. Uh, you, have to be, uh, you have to take an appropriate measured uh, and, and the correct scope when you want to translate some of these practices over. And so uh, a part of what I'll tell is just the, um, a good example we have is in Ghana and a partnership that we launched in October with, with Pioneer and with John Deere, focusing on how can we create the right framework for small scale systems that will utilize no-till, which is challenging uh, when you don't have mechanization, uh, as well as cover crops. And so we worked with John Deere to develop a no-till planter that could be pulled uh, by oxen. Uh, and we worked with Pioneer to develop the right mix of cover crops in the different regions of Ghana that we were working that could be edible cover crops and also serve as additional feed for livestock. Uh, and we pulled this together. We're, we're in the process of piloting it right now. And part of what we're doing through our family foundation is to help uh, underwrite some of the loans and take first loss, uh, put in first loss capital. And so we can make this uh, much more palatable for farmer cooperatives in the areas that we're trying to build this out. Uh, and one more point on that is, uh, is I'll say that uh, the focus that we've tried to take on this is really more um, on a demand-driven approach. So instead of having uh, your traditional philanthropic supply side perspective, we've tried to figure out 
how can we really create the demand for adopting these conservation-based practices and then allow the farmers to choose to adopt those practices and make those tools and that knowledge available for them so that it's demand-driven, so that they're choosing to do that. And so that's really been a big push. We have a no-till center that we launched uh, in Africa recently, um, and there's more information about that online as well. Great. Thank you. Um, do any of the other panelists want to follow up on that? We've covered so many different areas here. Do we have any other questions from the panelists at this point? Stride? Uh, no, thank you. You know, um, I just want to take you back to that little trip that I talked about to Mali. Uh, as you know, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa began as an initiative uh, of the Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation to build an alliance to push a new green revolution in Africa based on smallholder farmers. As we were walking around, I pointed out that the farmers were women. The other observation that I made whilst we went around was there were a lot of young people, young men, who were roaming around in gangs. They were not threatening, but they were there. You, f you felt their presence. A year after we left, Mali exploded in an insurgency, which as you know, became a costly war. Now the area that we were in is not much different from the area where the young girls were abducted barely a month ago, except on the other side in Nigeria. It's not much different from the area where the young people that attack the mall in Kenya came from. We have to connect the dots. There is an urgency to what we are now discussing. And it's about our national, let me say, you say national security, but we say global security because we're in it together. So we're running out of time in terms of the things that we need to do. And agriculture gives us a tool that we can use to address very constructively some of the challenges we've talked about. We've talked, of course, about climate change. We in Agra are working across the value chain looking at seeds, looking at soils, looking at markets, looking at extension services. We are thinking about the issues of the youth. There's a wonderful expression I heard yesterday called radical collaboration. And that radical collaboration requires us to bring in African governments in a way that hasn't been done before because this is ours, it's Africa, we have to own this if we are going to have sustainable solutions. So we are trying to help our farmers by helping, by breeding small, uh, new varieties of seeds. There was a wonderful presentation by Pamela Anderson, which talked about some of the initiatives, so I won't go into that in a great way. But we're also trying to draw in entrepreneurs, build this around a model of entrepreneurship that draws in young people that makes agriculture interesting for them. Because until now, the smallholder farmer, their mother, who is 70% of Af Africa's farmer, they see it as a, as a poverty trap. So unless we can create new models that attract them to agriculture, we will, not, we will have a, a revolution, whether brown or green, I don't know. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anyone want to follow up, a follow-up question on that? I, I'd like to, first of all, I think we should not forget that the African governments have had a sea change in their attitudes towards agriculture generally, and they are very concerned about climate change. The 10% the of uh, government expenditure promise that most of African countries have made now is a really positive step. We need to make sure, I mean we, you, need to make sure that they spend it in productive ways on dealing with the kind of challenges that you talked about. So I think, and I think we need to give some kudos to the African governments for moving in the right direction. And Africa is, you know, there's a success story in across the southern Africa's 
south of the Sahara that is not always widely recognized. So I think there's some good news there. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, also about this issue of what the US government can and should do. And I want to actually name some names. Um, so I said basic research is really important. NSF is one of the funders of the basic research. And NSF has been notoriously absent in the whole discussion about agriculture. And I think that, to, to their credit, they're making a few steps in that right direction. And we all need to encourage them to continue those steps. Because I think this basic research will be really important. Um, along the same lines, the USDA, uh, as part of the, farm, uh, the new farm bill, has set up something called the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research with $200 million of federal funds that needs to be matched by $200 million of non-federal funds. So that's the first challenge is to get the matching. But I think the second challenge, and, and more importantly in some sense, is what should it spend that research dollars on? And I think we have some clear priority research topics that that foundation needs to work on. Uh, the Department of Energy funds research that is about modeling, which I think is very important. And with respect to energy, of course, in the first instance, but agriculture has played a role in the energy environment. And DOE needs to step up to the plate with helping out in these climate change and food security issues. And lastly, I would ask the well, two, other, two other names. The first of all, in the trade negotiations that the US is undertaking, environmental uh, considerations, in particular adaptation to climate change, has been sort of taken off the table. And I think that needs to be re re reversed. And finally, and in some ways perhaps most importantly, is what the State Department does um, under the guidance of the administration at the UNFCCC negotiations. Agriculture has been left off the table in those negotiations almost exclusively. The US is in a leading position to do something about that, and it really needs to do so. Can I just jump in here? I, sure. I think that uh, one theme that's run across a lot of the, the points here is that um, is about practices and performance. And, and I would say that we need to start focusing more on performance and, and let farmers use whatever practices yield the best performance given how much land or capital or labor they have to invest in what they're actually growing. But if we want to look at a result that we actually want to see from a sustainable ag, from a climate smart ag point of view, I think it's one of the single best indicators would be soil health. And this is where the climate world and the ag world need to come together because if we could find a way to start paying farmers for carbon, particularly for sequestering carbon in soil, that would increase productivity, it would reduce water use, it would reduce fungicide use, pesticide use, fertilizer use, and it would increase productivity and net farmer income. Uh, it would make farming more resilient. So we really need to kind of focus on that. Carbon markets could be extremely helpful in doing that. If farmers can, can sell two or three things rather than just a single commodity uh, every time they go. The other, the other issue that I think this raises, and I think Bill Riley mentioned in the first panel, and that is we have a lot of underperforming land out there. One, and, and degraded land. And one of the ways to turn that back into productive land is to build soil carbon. Uh, and there are lots of practices that do that, and they're going to vary by continent, by geographies, and, and whether it's temperate or tropical or whatever. But a focus on bringing 250 million hectares of land back into production, uh, or fully into production that is degraded and underperforming, could account for 10% of global calories. Uh, it could also sequester three to five gigatons of carbon a year. I mean, these are twofers and threefers where we're actually getting productivity, we're solving some problem issues, we're solving small farmer and social issues, and, and I think we need to look at the sweet spot where we can address many things with one strategy. So, Ju Ju Judith, do you, I, I wonder if you would wa want to follow up on um, the, the soil issue and, and looking at livestock management and how that can help with soils. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear Jason talk about this because I think this, this is the, the sweet spot. And also, when we start to look at um, this underperforming land, it brings, us, it brings attention to land function, which I think we could look at more. Um, because when we, when we think of a lot of, the, a lot of the challenges that we attribute directly to climate change, actually, we can also see as symptoms of poor functioning land. So in terms of drought, um, it's not necessarily a matter of the rain that falls from the sky. It's also a matter of how much 
water the land can absorb, and land that, soil that doesn't have carbon cannot absorb much water. So you can have a lot of rainfall and drought conditions. Um, the same goes for flooding, that um, if, if land has, if it's functioning land with um, a lot of organic matter, then it can absorb water rather than having it stream away. And um, as Jason said, the way that we look to enhance land function, enhance the soil health, will depend on the type of land we're dealing with, the type of weather patterns, et cetera. But um, certainly in a large part of the world, um, from all my research, I do think that livestock and properly, properly managed livestock are key. So let me follow up on something that, that Stride mentioned, and that was the role of women in agriculture. And um, I, I think it'd be very interesting to flesh that out a little bit more. So I wonder, Danielle, if you wanted to, um, to discuss and talk about the importance of targeting women as key players in mitigating and adapting to climate change and what the role of women could be in that uh, arena. Sure. Right before I do that, I want to <clears throat> uh, go back to Strive's point about youth in, in agriculture. The, the average age, according to the latest U.S. Ag Census of, of farmers in the United States, is 58.3 years old. In Africa, it's around 57 years old. So there's a real need to bring in uh, more people to agriculture and to really cultivate that next generation of agricultural leaders. Not just farmers, but scientists and agronomists and extension agents and you know people who are going to fund agriculture, agricultural entrepreneurs. And so that sort of fits into the idea of we need to make agriculture also more attractive to women and girls. Women make up 43% of the agricultural labor force in developing countries, and in some countries, as Strive alluded to, they make up 70 to 80 percent of the agricultural labor force, and yet they, they lack access to land, to financial and banking services, to credit, uh, to inputs, to education and extension services, and we're really ignoring them at our own peril. Uh, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has found that if, we, if women had the same access to those resources as male farmers, they could lift 100 to 150 million people out of hunger. And so again, we're ignoring them at our own peril, but it, it's not enough to, to provide the access to those resources and, and, and you know, make sure that they have the same things as, as male farmers. We need to really focus on women's empowerment in every, aspects, every aspect of their lives. And this is something that the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Olivier de Schuter, pointed out when he was doing his term, that we, it, women's empowerment needs to go beyond agriculture. It needs to be in every part of their lives, and we need to make sure that that's happening through, you know, educating um, women and girls, educating boys and men and families, and really making that a part of, of all of the work that we do in the agriculture sector, whether it's around climate change or, or, or hunger or obesity or any of the, the things that we're all very concerned about. Women's empowerment needs to be key to all these issues. Thank you. Um, one, I've, I've been watching the, the Twitter uh, wall over there, and it's been really interesting. As soon as we started talking about making agriculture attractive to youth, there were a lot of different comments on that. Um, and, and so I wonder if we can drill down a little bit more into that. What, what can specifically be done to make agriculture more attractive? I mean, obviously there's some economic aspects of it, um, there are some social aspects of it. Um, what, what are some ideas that you all might have? I'll just say very briefly, I think we have to continue to, to support uh, and expand on programs such as the Future Farmers of America and 4-H. 4-H uh, has been doing a tremendous job expanding globally. And uh, the stronger those organizations are and the better embedded they are and partnered with uh, international universities and extension systems, uh, the better we can attract youth to, to that cause. I think farmer mentoring programs, whether they're here in the United States or elsewhere, are very uh, good at, at teaching farmers different skills. Uh, for farmers who especially didn't grow up in farming families who are new farmers, you know, giving them the, the access to not only land from, from you know, older farmers, but also the skill set, I think, is very important. So they have someone to ask questions to and, and learn different skills and, and learn what has worked and what hasn't. Those, those kinds of things can be very important. Just to build off that, I'm very sorry, I just want to say I could not be where I am today 
and I could not have been successful in farming for three years if it weren't for my father. And the transfer of knowledge and of wisdom and understanding of incredibly complex systems is imperative if you want to be successful in farming. You know, a, a single spoonful, I'm sure you know, of highly organic soil has more living organisms than there are people on the planet. Th these are more complex systems than anyone in this room understands fully. I mean, it, it just, it's mind boggling. And so you have to have the right mentorship in place and you have to have the right support systems generationally, I think, to help out as you bring more youth into the picture. Yes. When I talk to the African youth, they tell you, one, they need land. The, the, the traditions and the practices around access to land uh, need, we need to focus on, on that if the youth are to come in. They need to see it as a business. They, they need to see it as a way to prosper. Otherwise, they're head, headed to the cities. It's a rational decision. We need to, they need access to technology. They have to, they have to see it as cool <laughs> from a technological point of view, whether you're talking about access to information through ICT or technologies around food systems, they need to see it in that context. And finally, they need access to, they, it, they, they don't want to see it as a back-breaking way of life. They, have, they know what, how farming is done in America and everywhere else, let me tell you. So it's, it's not rocket science. Thank you very much. I think that, that also, um, we need to realize that you can be part of a food system without being a farmer. And I think for a lot of really small farmers and the children of small farmers, becoming a small farmer with half as much land as your parents had is going to be a very tough row to hoe. So why don't we start focusing on value-added processing, on aggregation, on other, other industries that are not in urban areas necessarily, but are a step out of farming and, a, and yet a step still in it, so that, that we can find ways to add value, to reduce losses, to create income, uh, generate employment in different kinds of ways. We haven't really focused on that, I think, enough. Any other comments on this? Um, it, it's a challenge, particularly um, in, also in the U.S. when you, know, you talk about the knowledge being passed down from, um, from parents to children, from um, mother and father to, to, to their children. Um, but there's fewer family farms, and so just the basis is, is less. So there needs to be some other kinds of issues. But I want to turn to something else. The other thing that's, um, that's been lighting, lighting up the, uh, the, the Twitter wall a little bit earlier was um, the comments about food loss and, and how we could feed so many people. So I'd like to turn to that. Um, so uh, this, this is actually from the, um, the Post Harvest Loss Institute, and they're asking, tech is supposed to, technology is supposed to curb food losses. Why aren't food losses being reduced? And I think that's a question that goes from um, everyone's kitchen to uh, food production to Africa to, to any developed country. So that, that's, I think, a very interesting uh, topic about uh, just loss of food. So. So can I take out my other hand in this particular <laughs> regard? Um, the food loss issue is one uh, that circulates in the agricultural economics profession every 20, 30 years or so, where the topic of the technical loss of, of stuff that comes out of the ground and doesn't end up in the mouths of people um, is a perennial concern. And uh, I would say the sort of the bottom line on the research of 20 years or so ago was that there's a huge difference between what technically occurs and what's economically possible to do about it. And I think that basic conclusion applies today, um, that there are costs to, that need to be incurred if you're going to reduce the quantity of food that's lost. Um, and it's not clear where in the marketing chain those costs should occur and whether or not they will actually pay for themselves. And I think as technologies improve, that will get, we'll get better in that regard. Um, but I would also say that there's a certain amount of, um, you know, you refocus business. Um, businesses are run by people and we all have limited attention spans. And so you focus on things that you know the best. And in the past, the uh, attention has been on things other than, than loss and waste. And I think I remember a report about how um, environmentalists were pestering Walmart about their excessive packaging. 
And when Walmart finally focused on this, as opposed to other things that they were, uh, were looking at, they discovered that they could actually save about $10 billion in changing the way they did packaging. And so I think this attention to food loss now, again, it's always good to bring these things back up, may actually cause businesses to look at it and say, oh, you know, maybe there's a day I can change this practice and, and reduce some losses and make the, money at it. I think the cost of, of food is too low in developed countries to actually make it a, a, an affordable thing to actually reduce food loss. Yeah. And I think the cost of disposing of food waste is too low as well. Uh, and so we're seeing New York City and other places putting a, a bigger tax on food waste uh, as a way to begin to make people begin to manage that issue. Because we're not, if we don't start measuring this, if we don't start paying for it, we're not going to manage these issues. So in developing countries, it's a different thing. It's about infrastructure, it's about coal storage, it's about you know, roads and transportation, all those issues where food is just a, food loss is a byproduct of an inefficient system in many other ways as well. So is healthcare, so are other, other things. Um, but given how important this could be to solving the productivity issue, if we simply used what we were already producing that would take so much pressure off the environment. The, the ultimate irony here is that food waste and losses actually keep producer prices lower than they would be otherwise. And that, I think, is the hardest thing to swallow in all of this uh, as we're trying to figure out how to increase income for rural poor. Because the, the, those small farmers we were talking about, that's where half of the severe, most severe malnutrition is on the planet, farmers who can't feed themselves and their own families. I mean, that's, that's the irony of this whole discussion. Let me um, uh, turn to another topic, um, and, and that touches on some of the things that, that Jerry talked about. Um, and, and we've also heard it here with, uh, with, with the question um, from the Post-Harvest Lost Institute, technology supposed to curb food loss. So there's clearly a role for technology, a, vo a role for research. The, the research enterprise um, globally is extremely complicated. You have um, industry, uh, some of the very large firms doing some really very high-tech uh, research. We have not-for-profits, um, such as uh, in, in Missouri, we have the Danforth Plant Science Center. Uh, we have the CGIR. We have universities doing research. We have foundations supporting research, Gates, um, Rockefeller with Rice in the past. So how does this, uh, how does this all parse out? Are there gaps? Um, are there areas where even though we have all of these players, the research is not being done? What are some of the key research um, areas that we need to focus on? particularly in terms of adapting to climate change and touching on some of the issues that we talked about, uh, soils and, um, and response to variable, uh, to variable weathers. I, I'm, I'm always going to have in my mind an image of your, your brown corn springing back to life. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I can offer something, and that's just to keep in mind the challenge, of, the challenge that there is in researching complex systems that often there's a tendency in, in research to measure what you can measure, you know, and you might get a, a linear measure or, you know, such and such rises, such and such falls. But often in complex systems, it's hard to really know what's going on by using um, the techniques that we, the, that we tend to, to use or that could offer results within a, um, an appropriate, appropriate time period. So. A lot of what I've learned so much from is people who do old-fashioned kind of research, which is observation, and also learning from what, observing and also learning from natural systems, which have been managing complexity for a long time. So um, learning what we can from natural systems. I would say, and you could see the resilience and what you talked about was a reflection of nature's desire to heal itself, which... Thankfully it did. <laughs> no. you know, to that exact point, um, part of what we've strived to do on our uh, research farms in Illinois and Arizona and South Africa is to have research plots that are uh, no smaller than 80 or 100 acres. And so part of what I, I, I like to encourage the scientific community about, at least, is to, uh, it, it, when you have the resources available, expand the size of your research plots uh, and, and, and go after a real-world 
uh, situations that you can put uh, to test because we have found with our, you know, if you look at a 160 acre field, the number of different soil types, the variability, the water drainage, I mean, the, just the, the variables are off the charts. Um, and so a lot of times we need to be doing our research in, in very real world situations, mm -hmm. which I think can be challenging depending on the space you have and the resources and the money you have and everything. I, th I think, let me take a, a, a different tack on this. I, I don't think we're, we're data scarce. I think we have lots of data. Uh, the problem is today it takes 10 to 12 years for better practices to move around the globe. Now, in, a, in an age of IT, that seems absurdly long. So why can't we manage systems of sharing information faster? Uh, we know how to solve a lot of problems about post-harvest losses, about post-consumer waste. We know how to address those issues, but we're not sharing information so everybody learns faster. The world is, this, the pace of life today is much faster than it used to be. China took 650 million people above the poverty line in 25 years. They're moving 250 million people out of rural areas into six cities in the next, um, let's see, 11 years. So what's our response to that? We don't have 15 years to do a research project on this. Uh, we need to do better with what we've got at hand. Uh, and that means sharing information, setting up open source databases, seeing sharing as a pre-competitive approach. How do we use resources more effectively? Which, which are the big impacts and what are the five or six practices that reduce them, not just one? And how can I, as a small farmer in Africa or a bigger farmer in the Midwest, figure out how to tap into that and, and, and then put my information back in the system so it's a pay-to-play thing? I use the data there, I give my data back. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think that there's a need for thinking about how we do research differently. There's not nearly enough participatory research. There's a lot of uh, us in the agricultural development field, I think, uh, go into communities and tell them what they want rather than asking them what they need. What do they want research? What will help them? What will, again, help them do their jobs better as farmers and food producers and agricultural entrepreneurs. So I think, you know, bringing more people into the, the research and development space, you know, unusual suspects, uh, they shouldn't be, but they are, the farmers themselves. Yeah. Let me, let me, yes. I just want to, I want to amplify on a couple of things that Jason said. I think it's not just open data, source data, it's open source modeling as well, mm -hmm. because we need to combine the two in order to understand where, where we're headed. I would say I've talked about my particular high-tech and basic research priorities, but one that I didn't mention but, but, but has come up in this is the whole issue of as systems operation. Ask yourself the question, why it is that a typical, if there is such a thing, farmer in Africa uses four or five crops in a single field and you're growing corn on, on, on 80 acres? And I think the answer has to do, well, there's many different parts to that answer, but one of them has to do actually with the potential for information technology. You know, it's really complex what you have to figure out how to grow corn. It's even more complex to figure out what you're going to do in that field. But if you do experiments over generations or, uh, you know, you learn what works in a particular location at a particular time. First of all, we need to capture that information. But then we need to apply the latest ability to manage and, and understand volumes of data, which we don't have in this particular arena to figure out how, you know, in 20 years you can have mixed cropping in your fields. So at this point, I think we're out of time. I want to very much thank all of our panelists. Um, this was a really interesting discussion. Thank you to those on Twitter. Um, it was really great to get the feedback as it was coming in. Um, and thank you, of course, to the Chicago Council for this great session. <laughs>